Plans for a new state in northern Mali with links to Al-Qaeda are complicating an already unstable situation. Just what are the regional implications of an Islamic territory in the West African country? You're watching Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Dedi Nabugeda. Two rebel groups that took over northern Mali earlier this year had agreed to form an alliance and create an Islamic state. Ansar al-Din is said to have links to al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb, while the National Movement for the Liberation of the Azawad or the MNLA is led by the Tuaregs. The two sides signed an agreement on Saturday, but now that deal appears to be unraveling, and that's because they disagree over how strictly to impose Islamic law or Sharia. Ibrahim Asali, a member of the MNLA, says this. We have refused to approve the final statement because it is different from the protocol agreement which we have signed. He then went on to say it is as if they want us to dissolve into Ansar al-Din and that is unacceptable. Well, the West African bloc, ECOWAS, was quick to reject the idea of an Islamic state in northern Mali. And the newly elected French president, meanwhile, he was categorical. He said that France would only consider involvement in Mali under a framework of a UN Security Council decision. Well, the conflict in Mali began in March. Now, there was a coup led by low-ranking soldiers at the time. They were angry at what they said was a failure by the government to stamp out a separatist rebellion in the north. They attacked various parts of Bamako, including the presidential palace. And within 24 hours, they had announced they overthrew the elected government of President Amadou Toumani Touré. Three weeks later, the coup leaders agreed to relinquish power to an interim government, but by then it was too late, and the rebellion in the north had split the country in two. All right, so what are the implications of an Islamic state in northern Mali? To answer this, we're joined by our guests in London, Shiraz Maher, a senior fellow at the International Centre for Study for Radicalization at King's College London. We have in Leeds, Akli Shika, who's a spokesman for Imuharg Organization for Justice and Equality. Akli is also a human rights advocate for the Tuareg and Berber people in Mali. And over in Dubai, Sylvain Touati, associate fellow for the French Institute for International Relations and and also a specialist on African politics. Welcome all of you gentlemen to this edition of uh, Inside Story. Uh, Selva, if I can come over to you first, how do you read into the situation that's going on in, in the north of Mali after the rebels group, as I'm saying, take control of that part of the country? Now it appears to be differences between the two. What are you thinking? But first, uh, it's not uh, really a surprise that uh, Ansardin and MNLA have been talking to each other. You have to remember that the leader of uh, Ansardin is a, is a former member of the MNLA. He was a spokesperson for the pre previous rebellion. And uh, so you always have a contact be contacts between uh, MNLA and Ansardin. Uh, even we have uh, some report uh, at the beginning of the rebellion that uh, he created Ansardin because he couldn't take over the leadership of MNLA. So um, we've seen during the offensive of the rebellion for the different group from the rebellion that uh, they have been acting together, even if there is uh, some rivalries between the two groups. Uh, most of the members of Ansardin were Tuaregs themselves. Uh, the agenda are a little bit different. Uh, on Sardin is uh, pushing, has always been pushing for uh, an Islamic agenda in, uh, the, in northern Mali, while uh, MNLA has been uh, claiming that they are uh, pushing for secularism. Uh, the fact that they found an agreement is also showing that uh, for the last two months since they took power in northern Mali, uh, this, these groups, and also you can include uh, Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb, but also you have other groups in, in the north now, uh, it's very difficult to, to find uh, uh, one person to discuss, to negotiate with Bamako or with ECOWAS. Right, and I think right, this agreement okay. was welcomed by, uh, by uh, Mr. Basole from Burkina Faso, who was saying, at least now we will have one, uh, one, one, uh, one interlocutor for, for the negotiation. Okay, we will but talk about how this affects uh, that, Bamako. Yeah. We will talk about how this affects Bamako, but just tell me what you think, how you think this split is going to impact the deal that was made between Ansar al-Din and the MNLA to create the state, if it's going to impact it in any way. Um, 
Of course, of course. Um, the, we, we've seen that in three days, uh, you have some uh, people within the MNLA that say, OK, uh, maybe we went too far with this deal on, with Ansardine. And it's really interesting that only three days afterwards, they finally read what is uh, the protocol they signed. Uh, Ansardine is really clear about his agenda. They want to promote an Islamic state imposing, uh, imposing Sharia to the population of the northern Mali. Uh, MNLA, some members of MNLA have always been pushing for secularism. So the deal is going to be about this. Uh, we, we're going to see the element between the two groups are going to negotiate and find or not an agreement about that. Also, you have to remember that MNLA was claiming about secularism to try to get the attention from Western countries. The MNLA at the beginning of the rebellion was claiming, OK, if we can maybe get some funding or some, uh, or some weapons from Western, Western countries, if at least MNLA is recognized as an official interlocutor for the problem in Northern All Mali, right. they, maybe will, they maybe will fight against Al-Qaeda in Islamic Maghreb. And okay. that's been the dream of many security services in, the, in Europe or in the US to have one group in Northern Mali that can fight against Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb. All right. And okay, let me bring in Akhli Shika. Uh, is not going to help that. Okay, we'll talk about that in just a moment. But first, uh, Akhli Shika, would you call this a split now between Ansar al-Din and the MNLA? How do you see it playing out? No, I don't think it's split. It's just uh, it's just to uh, maybe some mistakes that uh, been on the uh, protocol that have been signed by between MNLA and uh, and Sardine, and uh, because the majority of uh, MNLA or the majority of Azawadian people, they are not uh, happy about the uh, imposing Sharia or Islam uh, in Azawad. So it's, uh, it's it's very obvious that there is some uh, amendments to this agreement to go ahead. And uh, I think uh, as well, it's really a good uh, step forward when we hear this uh, the uh, Ansaruddin and uh, MNLA ha ha have united and uh, they are combined now. They have uh, sold, uh, they, they, one army in Azawad. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. I think some people actually misunderstood uh, Ansaruddin uh, and the MNLA. As uh, uh, Tawati, Mr. Tawati was saying, the, uh, the leader of this, uh, of this uh, movement, uh, the Ansaruddin, is, uh, is already the, one of the uh, Tuareg figures uh, who very well known as a leader. And uh, at the beginning of, uh, of the, the MNLA, uh, uh, the, uh, I think he's tried actually to lead the, uh, this movement because many people, the uh, majority of uh, Azawadian people are not happy with him because he, they call him as a failure man. And that's why uh, I think that's the mistake that the many people actually uh, committed uh, for the beginning. And that's why he recruited many people. And he was saying that I am going to impose Sharia. And uh, I, my agenda is to have an, uh, an Islamic uh, state uh, border without bordering. And uh, that's why the many groups in, in Islamic Maghreb, they use this void. And the MNL uh, uh, finally find themselves actually with a big problem, uh, unexpected actually problems with the many groups that was hiding in, in, in the vast Sahara. They just find them actually uh, recruited by Iyad Ghali. And uh, that's why the, the first condition on the, this protocol uh, by, that the MNL ported on them is a refusal any uh, foreign groups in Azawad. We are not going to negotiate or have any deal or an accept, accept any outsiders who are fighting with you. And that's why the Ansaruddin accepted it. And they said, OK, we are not going all the groups that so no Azawadian people are going to leave the country. And uh, but we have a condition just to put the Islamic uh, Islam as a Zawad Islamic state. Uh, and that's, uh, I think, Amin al are very, very actually uh, intelligent or smart because already there is the majority of Azawadian uh, uh, are Muslims. So what's wrong if we put this and uh, avoid fight, internal fighting with these groups and, and wait for chances, the community, international community, and uh, who want to fund us and help us to to chase these groups outside of territory? All right. And, uh, okay. Let's let's also, Shiraz, yeah. Shiraz Maher. Uh, what's your take? Do you agree with uh, what uh, Akli Shika there is saying, as well as uh, Selvan? 
Well, I think when we're looking at uh, Ansar al-Din here and, and the prospects of this relationship unraveling, um, I, I'm slightly more pessimistic. I think it's going to come down to how the interpretation of Sharia and its implementation um, is, is going to play out now. It looks like the MNLA are not so keen to impose such a conservative view. And Ansar al-Din, I think, given links to al-Qaeda that might exist, particularly with al-Qaeda in the Islamic uh, Maghreb, and then um, with other groups as well, the movement uh, for unity and jihad in West Africa, for example, has um, been making noises about what's happening in Mali and moving into the area as well. And I think if their influence wins over, then al and Din will take a much more uncompromising view. And then there's a potential for internal fighting between the two groups if it comes down to it. But Given, uh, as your other contributors have mentioned, that Iyad Ghali is, has uh, uh, connections with the MNLA, he's from them, um, he was their spokesman and so on, if they're able to win him over, uh, I think, and, and as it were, maintain this idea of keeping the unity there and, and uh, avoiding infighting, then it all really comes down to him and who can win him over, I suppose, to their agenda. That's what's going to matter, and that will dic dictate whether this goes into conflict or not. Akli? Yeah. Uh, yes, uh, I think uh, yes, uh, I'm agree with him uh, a lot of things that he said. But uh, the the uh, uh, the good thing about this agreement or this protocol that have been signed between you groups is the the Tuareg people since 1990s, since the first 90, since 1963, the problem they have got with whenever they came to the end of fighting, they return their guns to each other, and this is the experience that Emmanuela have, and that's why they're trying to avoid and uh, this uh, fighting with the, uh, any groups and uh, to just focus to how they collect all the Azawadian people uh, towards the, the, to the creation of Azawad. And that's why the uh, agreement actually, uh, I think the, the winners here actually, the MNLA and the Azawad people and also the, uh, even the region actually, when we avoid this uh, fighting between groups and especially there's a lot of uh, groups like uh, Tawheed and others who are just rooming in the area without any control, they can use that avoid as well, attacking neighboring countries. And they, uh, so this is actually a good move. And uh, uh, I think the MNLA and I need to focus uh, about how to uh, make uh, that in Saradin uh, to make some concessions, and that's what they are trying to do now uh, because the Sharia law. Uh, as we, it's, it has many interpretations actually. When you say Sharia, it's not uh, in Islamic actually. We have two types of Sharia law. The, the type that the Ansar uh, al agreed with is in the modern one. It's not one is going to cut off the hands or, or, uh, or prevent, uh, prevent women going outside. Uh, no, that's not kind of these, uh, the, the one the, uh, the al actually agreed with the Ansar Deen. Right. Uh, Sylvain, let me just pick up on a point that you brought up a little earlier on. And, uh, of course, knowing uh, what happened uh, back in March during Mali, the coup there at the time, do these differences now that appear to be um, occurring between Ansar al-Din as well as the MNLA, do they simplify negotiations uh, with the rebels when it comes to Bamako? Or is it just complicating an already unstable situation in Mali. Also, we know that ECOWAS has come out and said that they categorically reject any creation of an Islamic state in the north of the country. So what can ECOWAS do at this point? But the thing for ECOWAS and at least even the authorities in Mali, even if the authorities in Mali are have too much problem to deal with between them before going to negotiate in the north right now. Um, the thing is for ECOWAS and I, it was a spokesperson, Mr. Basoli, we say we were saying that at least to find one uh, one group to negotiate, or at least one uh, to have one interlocutor in the north, because okay, we focus on Ansardin and MNLA, but those are two people also mentioned the other groups, and uh, you have to also remember something in northern Mali. Is you don't only have Tuaregs. Tuaregs are only one part of uh, northern Mali. You have Arab population, you have more, you have also the Pearl, you have different people there. And uh, they have also the vision about this rebellion that is maybe uh, not going to agree with what MNLA and Ansardin are uh, negotiating right now. But for ECOWAS, at least that the main re uh, armed rebel group are gathering together and they can find an agreement with them, ECOWAS will find someone to discuss with. But we're not uh, going to change anything uh, about the, the basic of the conflict. Uh, these two groups are now procla are proclaiming an independent state that ECOWAS is not going to accept. And uh, all the countries in the region are not going to accept it. 
and uh, and that's going to be uh, not going to change this line in the negotiation. Shiraz, what do you think uh, ECOWAS's options are? Well, just before I comment on that, I wanted to add uh, a caveat to what um, Sylvain was saying, and, and I think this is it. All the discussion of the relationship between the MNLA and Ansar al-Din and, and how they're trying to avoid this internal conflict is happening at the leadership level. But you have to appreciate the MNLA has been campaigning for and fighting for independence for a very long time. And at the grassroots, that has been a campaign which has been not Islamist, largely secular. And so if a leadership uh, deal is made to avoid infighting and which concedes power to the Islamists, there's every chance that at the grassroots people will rebel against the leadership of the MNLA. So the prospect for conflict still remains very high. With regards to ECOWAS and their options in, in uh, Mali, I don't think uh, they really have many options. I think the creation of an Islamic State of whatever color that will take place in, in uh, Mali is going to be welcomed in the region regardless. The Arab Spring has heralded the creation of um, post-dictatorial Islamic states. The Anahda party has taken power now in Tunisia. We're seeing the Muslim Brotherhood make great strides in Egypt. And of course, the Al-Nur party has taken a, a number of parliamentary seats. It looks like uh, Morsi could obviously win the presidency there as well. So the, the sort of Islamists and Islamic states, if you want to call them that, are emerging now in North Africa post Arab Spring. And Mali in that context is no different. So ECOWAS, I think, is going to be very um, limited in what it can really do and to bring pressure to bear on, on them. All right, well, let's just uh, discuss uh, a further point because it appears that there seems to be a rise in parts of Africa of groups that are eager to implement their own interpretation of uh, Sharia or Islamic law. Let's take a look at uh, some examples. In Somalia, for example, the Al-Shabaab group controls southern parts of the country with links to Al-Qaeda. Its members uh, describe themselves as fighting what they call the enemies of Islam. In Nigeria, Boko Haram strongly opposes what it describes as man-made law based in the northeast of the country. The group wants to abolish the secular system of government. And over in Algeria, the AQIM, Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb, is a militia group. And it wants to overthrow the Algerian government and introduce what it calls an uh, Islamic uh, state. Uh, Sylvain, over to you. The situation in Mali, does it pave the way for uh, other groups to declare independent states of their own, you think? No, for it's a special situation that you can find in northern Mali and maybe in northern Niger, even if the situation right now has a little, little bit changed. You have to remember that even if the MNLA has claimed independence in April, it was quite a surprise for the people who were following the movement because this claim of independence was really huge in the 1970s, 1980s, uh, but with the rebellion in 1990s afterwards, we didn't have this claim for independence anymore, at least among the elite of the Tuaregs. It was more claim for more autonomy and everything. And I think the fact that the crisis in Bamako pushed the MNLA and the, and the other group in the north to say, look, we don't have anyone in Bamako. Uh, anyway, the state in northern Mali has never been really present. So let's go back to our claim of independence. And no one uh, in Bamako could do anything about it at the moment. And even ECOWAS, even if ECOWAS deployed troops in northern Mali, uh, is to create a buffer zone. No one wants to really uh, get involved in northern Mali, uh, like putting a soldier on the field and uh, or anything like that. So the, if the group in northern Mali find an agreement and they find some funding, international funding to, to finance their government, uh, they can become a, an independent state. But and it's where really would they find such international to northern funding Mali. From? Where would they find such international funding? Just, uh, just to re to come back on this rise of this Islamic claim also in in northern Mali, and that maybe could uh, answer to some of your question, is the fact that uh, the most powerful and at least the most funding group in northern Mali at the moment was uh, be uh, between uh, Ansardine and, and MNLA was Ansardine with his link with Al Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb. Uh, for the many for the last decade, uh, the the Al Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb and other rebel groups in the north have been uh, protecting different trafficking. They also have uh, you have a very lucrative uh, hostage businesses uh, that has been going for the last five years we're talking about 120 million uh, euros uh, in, uh, in northern Mali that help you to buy some uh, loyalty it's helped you also to uh, to uh, to gain some uh, recruits among the, 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 the region of northern Mali which is one of the poorest in the world right. and even if you have an independent state in, no in northern Mali uh, what will be is a capacity to do uh, to develop the, this region uh, we're talking about a 
desertic region. Uh, there are not many prospects about uh, about agriculture or about um, any, any economic development. And uh, the Tuareg rebels are making a really good stand about it. The fact that right. this region needs to Actually, be developed economically. Actually and by Shika. claiming the Islamic things, you can get some money maybe from Gulf states. Let's or from, put some uh, of what you brought up, uh, Sylvanta Akli. Let's just put some of uh, these points to Akli. Akli, seeing as there is uh, this link between Ansar al-Din and al-Qaeda in the Islamic ba Maghrib, and now Ansar al-Din and the MNLA have uh, joined forces, how much collusion is there between the MNLA now and al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghrib? And is it, uh, should it be uh, worrying? To be honest, uh, for me and for many people, uh, the experts who know the area very well, including Jeremy Keenan, I don't know if you heard about the Dark Sahara, the book which he wrote about the, the rule of uh, Islamic uh, Al-Qaeda in Islamic Maghreb. I think it, it gives a really uh, a clear picture of what's really going on. And uh, Al-Qaeda actually is uh, intelligence services of Algerian countries who don't want the Azawad or the, the Tuareg people have their own state, whether in Algeria or Libya or in, Alger or in Niger. And the, uh, the, uh, what's happening in the north of uh, Mali or Azawad is this the same groups who recruited actually by these countries. And this is the time they want to use them. And uh, I am not actually, uh, I don't trust Iyad Aghali actually as a, as a man who's working for the interest of Azawad people. Because if you think about it, and it's now uh, 53 years, and the Azawad people, the Tuareg people actually are fighting for this, and they got it without any blood without any losses and uh, it's one of the the, the most succeed you know revolution is in the uh, what they are calling the uh, Arabic uh, spring or Arabic spring without any support they didn't take any support from outside or inside they just fight and they they got this very easily uh, without any losses and they and now they managed actually to avoid another trap which is uh, trying these groups actually to bring it since the beginning almost a month now these groups actually are picking on on uh, MNLA and the others to fight with them but the MNLA are very uh, I think they are have done very well on this and they avoid a lot of problems and they bring now whoever saying that MNLA or Ansar, uh, I mean Ansar Din, they are controlling the control, uh, uh, controlling the, uh, the the Azawad. I think that's a really big mistake. They Shiraz. just don't want actually to be to fight with these groups because it will be you know uh, a bloodshed and they will get problems and Shiraz. they are not ready actually to, to internal right. fights. Let me get uh, Shiraz's thoughts. I mean. Uh, Following on from what your last contributor was saying, I, I think it's uh, incorrect to say that um, what's happened in Mali has not been affected by the Arab Spring and that it's entirely an internal thing. I mean, this would not have happened without Libya. The sophistication of arms, the heavy weaponry that has moved into Mali and um, supported the rebels there is a spillover from uh, the war in Libya and a, a number of the mercenaries that, that were fought there. So the idea that Mali is somehow being immune or is not interconnected to the politics of the region and the Arab Spring, uh, I think, is erroneous. As for uh, al-Qaeda and the Islamic Maghreb, well, it is possibly the weakest uh, and least potent of all of al-Qaeda's international chapters. So I think whilst they might be able to provide some institutional connections and some support, it's in no real position to influence things on the ground. I think much more interesting is Boko Haram in Nigeria and the connections there. Um, and they've obviously shown themselves willing to use terrorism right. um, to indiscriminately bomb civilian populations. And so that is something that, that could... Um, influence in Saar al-Din and, and, and start to play out there. Sylvain, let me the get your thoughts. Uh, uh, Shiraz, I do apologize, but Sylvain was uh, shaking his head uh, as you were speaking as well as Akli was speaking. So, uh, Sylvain, final thoughts to you. No, I just want to say, of course, uh, there is an interconnection in all the region and what happened in Libya has affected the Northern Mali. But the claim for independence of Northern Mali is a very uh, Malian issue. And even MNLA and Ansar Din Alliance on the creation of Azawad State, you have to remember that the only de common denominator for all the population, population in Northern Mali is Islam. And the claim of for an Islamic State is something important also to the other community in Northern Mali. You have to remember in the previous conflict in Northern Mali, uh, the fact that Bamako, the government in Bamako, could support uh, groups in the north that were not happy with the Tuareg leadership was really important. And the fact that claiming an Islamic state is also a signal to the other community in, in northern Mali. And that, if people don't understand that, it's also what the MNLA and maybe the other interlocutor was saying that MNLA is very smart about that. It's the fact that 
the other community in, in northern Mali are going to maybe more keen to accept a, a, a government in northern Mali or at least a certain form of authority around the Islamic religion more than a Tuareg uh, or uh, autochtony claim. And that is uh, something we need to keep uh, in mind. All right, we'll have to leave it there. Thank you very much uh, to my guests in London, Shiraz Maher, in Leeds, Akli Shika, and in Dubai, Sylvain Tuati. Thank you for joining us on Inside Story. And to our viewers, we always welcome your feedback. You can email your thoughts to us at insidestory at aljazeera.net. Thanks for watching. And for me and the whole team, goodbye for now.